This car has really not been moved much. It went from its original location from Ohio down to Gas Monkey Garage in Dallas and then up to us here back in November. Still in its original patina and dirt. Most of this dirt that you see on this car is 40-ish years of dirt from Ohio where it sat in a nice shop for decades. We got this thing running and we were told when we got it that the motor was locked up. That was not the case. We only had to change a couple small things, and yes, we kept the original parts. This thing surprisingly runs really nice to a point where all the lights and interior lights and bulbs work. Some people say keep the dirt on, some people say now clean it up. After long discussion, we have decided to clean the Shelby because with our experience, presenting a car in this way is really the best to get it out there. A lot of people don't understand the historical significance of this and they just look at it and it's like, why is this beat up dirty old car here? Uh, but actually, I've been doing this my whole life and you never see this. This is something that I just stare at all the time. It is now clean, so after about 42 years of a, a dormant phase that this GT500 went through, um, definitely had 40 years plus of dirt. We cleaned it and we're really happy how it came out. It was a very well preserved uh, GT500. Okay, let's start off at the very beginning with this car. Late in 1967, December to be exact, uh, a gentleman of the last name Livingston walked into Ed Martin Ford in Indianapolis. If you are a hot rodder, you already know about Ed Martin Ford. It's absolutely the Ford dealership, uh, not only in Indianapolis, but through the whole country. This car was completed and sold in February of 1968. When Mr. Livingston bought this car in Indianapolis, he had it for at least three or four years. But sometime in the very early 1970s, this car ended up on a used car lot in Greenville, Ohio. Uh, the gentleman who actually had this car in the lot was Harold Brewer. Harold Brewer owned the Brewer Auto Mart in Greenville. Um, I'm told Harold before he put it in the inventory, drove the car a little bit. He was a big Shelby fan himself. And then in, sometime in 1974, he decided to put this car for sale on his used car lot. And right away, a local family, the Dillons, uh, decided to come in and take a look at Harold's uh, inventory. Mom at the time had a had a Hemi Barracuda, an early one. So she gave her husband the Hemi Cuda and they bought her this. So when they first got it, they went to Sears, the car needed tires. And as you can see right down here, and these are the tires that they bought in Sears in 1974. And you will see these exact same tires uh, that are on the car today are in the photos from the early 70s. Unfortunately, the Dillons lost their job. They brought the car back up to Harold, and they're like, Harold, look, hey, we can't, uh, we can't afford this car anymore. So Harold said, you know, I'll tell you what, give me $50 and I'll hold the car. And we actually had that uh, agreement between the, the two families. The Dillons, I guess, took a while to get back up to get the car. Once they got everything figured out, they went up to see Harold. The car was already gone. So it's the end of 1974 and Harold takes repossession of the GT500 from the Dillons. He and his wife, in beginning in 1975, start building a new house, a new barn, and a new shop. Unfortunately, Harold dies of a sudden heart attack. So shortly after Harold passes in 1975, their new home is completed. Betty was, of course, didn't know what to do. Has a brand new house. You know, their dream is finally there. She actually drove this car through 75 
she went and took it to its last oil change um, in 1976, which at the time it had 69,700 miles on the odometer. The oil change sticker is still underneath the hood from that last oil change. And a little bit after that oil change, she drove about another 2,000 miles. And Harold already had a special spot in their new barn, their new shop for his cars. He knew that he was gonna start investing in cars and keep them preserved. And this is the place that he was going to do it. So in 2014, after taking inventory of Betty's large estate, she ended up living to September 2016. And Jean, her nephew, he had the task of liquidating not only Betty's household belongings, but also the three barn cars they found. So as Gene and the auctioneer are reaching out to classic car dealers all across the country, people started calling and expressing interest on these three cars. And one of these was one of our good friends, Richard Rawlings of Gas Monkey Garage. He called and said, hey, what's up with these three cars? I heard you got a GT500, are they for sale? You know me and you, I'm on plane immediately. <laughs> I'm like, I'll be there this afternoon, that's the best I can do, and uh, got the deal done. What's cool is he, he had a nice garage, so it's not stinky full of animals or rats or any of that. It's just very well-preserved car. And I was really amazed that all the tires held there. I just aired them up and off and go. So Scott and I, that November, went down to uh, Gas Monkey. We bought the Shelby, obviously, from him. We also bought the 1944 that was parked in the same barn next to the Shelby. Well, just like any real original survivor car. Uh, we see how the car stands today. We see what color it is, what interior, what option, options it has. But we always wonder is, does it look like the day it left the factory? Um, but that's what brings us to the most important part is documentation with a car like this. Your car is only as good as the documentation says. Of course, your number one first thing with a Ford of this vintage is uh, you want to get a hold of Kevin Marty of Marty Reports. And he looked up the car and was happy to report, not only did he have a Marty report, and, and you can see how this car left, but he had the original factory invoice for the Shelby. Now this is a pretty rare piece to get this. This is not a copy, this is the original. This is the only one in the world, and it's in great, great shape. This is a neat piece to see. We actually get to see how this car was ordered. It's optionless. You get to see the cost to the factory, the cost to the dealer and the retail pricing. You get to see the date, the serial number and the order number. Kind of the charity on top with that is we actually have the order form, the factory order form. And this car had two of them. I even asked them, I said, well, I usually cars don't have two. This first one, it's got a scratched out number here and it's now 1998. There's a couple line outs, there's a couple other missing information on this. We're thinking that the first order was messed up or changed for some reason. Uh, so this was put to the side, scratched out, and as you can see, 1998 was, was then uh, reapplied. And then this one is the real 1998, and this is the actual complete order form. So you get to see uh, that this car left um, for the American market, had the 428 uh, interceptor. Um, automatic transmission, had no air conditioning, of course a fastback, and also left the factory in white and with black interior. Um, of course it matches its invoice, uh, the dates and all the numbers and all that good stuff. And then the final piece I really want to show you is this the factory line sheet, broadcast sheet. And uh, this one I personally found underneath the dash and usually if you find a nice Survivor Mustang and if you go underneath the dash, usually if these are there, they're taped to the pigtail of the speedometer. And most of the time they're never ever there. It's in great, great shape. I think one of my favorite parts of the history of this car is this Indiana license plate. This is a license plate from Indiana in 1974. The early 1968 Shelby's had a couple different things in the rest of the year production. Probably one of the most fascinating about the early ones is that they actually came with the Marshall made in their, their French lights, fog lights. And these things right after production on the early cars were immediately recalled in the state of California for being basically too bright for the road. And you could bring them in and they would take these out and they would change them with the Lucas lights. So seeing an original early Shelby that still has, as, as people call the uh, recall lights, 
is really, really neat. I love Lucas lights, but I actually find these be a little bit more uh, attractive and they're different. So it always makes me smile when I see these in an early 68. Another cool part of the lighting of this car is the passenger side still has a original Ford Motor Company headlight. And that was the headlight that this car shipped with from the factory. And on the driver's side, it no longer has the original headlight, but it does have a period correct, um, I think it's a GE light. I would guess that this light's from like 72, 73, probably when the Dillons were driving around. It seemed like they're the only ones that put some money back into this car. All 68 Shelbys were built from the New Jersey line. They went to Michigan to A.O. Smith, who was the contractor for 68, to finish the Shelbys. And they actually painted the front fiberglass and all the other fiberglass, including the hood. So the body of the car was painted at the factory in New Jersey. Then these cars were shipped to Michigan and then these parts were painted there in Michigan and put on the car. The paint never really matched any of these cars. It was the first year that they were building them at A.O. Smith as a contractor. Um, so there was a lot of stuff being learned, a lot of lessons. This car pretty much retains all its original pieces. Every little detail that you look at, um, things like the blinker lights, the marker lights, they are the real Ford Motor Company. They're not the Repops. They're in great shape too. Um, we still have the original arch trim. Um, it's in fair condition, but it's the real deal. So these are the original 1968 hubcaps. And when they were shipped to the dealerships, they put the hubcaps in the box in the back of the trunk. And it was so when it got to the dealership, the dealership was to install those hubcaps. So a lot of these original hubcaps got lost, they got misplaced, they got sold off, they got put on different Mustangs than they want. It's just, uh, it's pretty neat to see the original hubcaps. It's kind of a big deal in 2018 to have a correct uh, hubcap Shelby. And I'm kind of agreeing to that. I like the look of it. It goes with the era. We get a little bit over here, we have the Cobra emblem, and this is the real deal also, just like pretty much any part in this car. The interesting kind of factoid and, and story behind this car is this area here, this GT500. Most of this stripe is original. Some of it is not, some of it's, it's got a little bit of a story behind it. So when we got it, we were missing the G, we were missing the zero, so basically it said T T50. As I was digging the history, I find that photo of the Dillons from 1974 with Matt Dillon with his little hat as a kid in front of the car. And as I noticed, if I really study the photo, I look at the car and I notice that the, the G and the zero in that photo in 74 are also missing. We finally debated to uh, just finish it out, put the GT500, because everyone kept asking what a T50 was, and no one really gave the whole story unless they explained the whole thing. So we took this over to our buddies over at Vinyl Images. They do great vinyl work. The driver's side is still the original Shelby stripes. So what Vinyl Images did is they actually went to the original side, hand copied it, reversed it, put it in the computer, and then printed this out. And it looks great, so now we have a perfect you know duplicate of the real deal so this car originally left the factory white it's still white today obviously but the best part of that it hasn't been resprayed or anything like this that this car really does contain most of its original paint and for it being original it's pretty shiny it's pretty darn nice for original paint there are quite a bit of touch-up spots that the Dillons did back in the 70s. And also, I can't say 100% uh, original paint because someone at one time did paint the underside of the deck lid. That's really the only spot. All the other fenders, all the sheet metal, hood, fiberglass pieces, they're original, they're original paint, other than some touch-ups here and there. And I definitely have confirmed that these are the real deal. Uh, when A.O. Smith put these things on, it was known that you could still see the glue that they used um, from the factory. Um, they didn't do it perfectly from the factory. They were kind of throwing this stuff on as fast as they can. Um, and this is, still has a lot of its originality. There are some touch-up paints on some of the fiberglass parts, but the good news is this is the original fiberglass from A.O. Smith. Um, as we kind of move back here, another really cool aspect of an early Shelby, like we talked about the recall lights, is the early 68 Shelbys had square, actually I should say rectangle, marker lights. So you're probably feeling like me, 
and you definitely want to know and see underneath the hood of this of the GT500. It is the most exciting part of the car. Um, so when we lift the car, the hood, the very first thing we want to see, as I always look on Shelby's, is underneath the hood. And the Repop fiberglass hoods, they just don't look like this underneath. And what I mean by Repop is reproduction. And they just don't look like this at all. Um, there's some really good aspects that you can see that A.O. Smith did, uh, the way they put the vents in, um, so many little details. The coolest one is this right here. Uh, but this is not a common factory marking because this was done at A.O. Smith. And this is their marking on, 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 under their side of their real original hood. Very neat to see. Um, and then we'll move over to one more really neat part of this hood is the last oil sticker, chain sticker right here. So we know at that time in 76 that the car had 69,000 miles. It's very clear on the sticker. The sticker's in great, great shape. Um, nice to see. This matches up with our story great. And the best part of it is the mileage that still works on this car. The dometer still works, by the way. And it's only 2,000 miles more since this point. So we know that this car has only been driven 2,000 miles since 1976. And I also know I'm the only one that has driven this car since 1976. So I've put about, I don't know, five or 10 miles on the car myself. And that's it. Um, so pretty neat to see that. We get down into the engine. This is where it gets really fascinating. I think the first thing I'm going to talk about is the tags. This is still factory installed. Those rivets are absolutely correct. The placement and everything is pretty cool. But we also go real quickly over here to the buck tag. That is the correct screw from the factory. And I can just kind of tell by the way it's bent up and the dirt around the screw that I don't think this thing's ever been removed either. And it's in great, great shape too. Uh, both fenders, as you can see, as you roll by, they got the right um, factory stamping on both sides. And you can see a lot of the factory overspray from the blackout paint up around here. And my favorite part of the blackout paint is right here. This is what you always want to see in a Shelby. You'll see a little overspray going over this, this white part here. That is correct. And a lot of restorers try to duplicate, but what they always mess up is the fender part here should never have overspray because the blackout paint was applied before this fender was put on. So it should not have, as you see, has no blackout paint on this fender part here, but on the cow part, you'll see the black coming over a little bit and then also the black to the actual engine bay. That's exactly what you want to see in a Shelby. I still have an inspection sticker Mustang Shelby's from New Jersey, you'll usually know that there was an inspection stamp put here in yellow. It is still there, but it's very, 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 very faint. Um, right there. It's there, but it's faint, but still pretty cool. So we go around the engine bay, we have a lot of neat, fascinating things to see. We have the sticker. This is the Autolite sticker. Um, very common repop sticker, but this one is indeed the real one. It's actually in really good shape. These things usually get pretty banged up because they're pretty exposed here on the shock tower. Another cool part of the opposite side of the shock tower on the uh, passenger side, it's hard to see, but there's an M, there's a chalk mark here. And M stands for white, which of course this car is white. Really neat to see that. If you go a little bit above the M on the shock tower, you go to the actual shock and uh, we indeed know that this is the original shock and what's really cool it's Ford corporate blue shock and uh, that's the way they came. Um, you also see the blue paint that's marked right here that matches the shock that's the marking for the shock and it still indeed contains that but to see the real blue corporate shock still in this car is really neat to see especially in the same area of the, uh, of the chalk mark for the paint coat. So as we look at this engine overall, we will see there's a ton of original paint pretty much everywhere where you want to see it. We move down to the block, it's, it's exactly the way you want to see it, it's Ford Motor Blue. Um, most of it's pretty retained pretty well on the block, it looks great. Um, one of my favorite parts is the uh, power steering pump. You'll see a lot of the original Ford Blue on that, that's really something you don't see at all. Um, as you know with Fords, the power steering pumps are always kind of problematic, so they're always getting repaired, they're always getting put out, they leak, and to see one that has almost all its original blue paint is really neat to see. 
Okay, so now you got to see all the really neat components, the originality of the engine of this Shelby. I'm pretty sure your number one question is, is when I got it or when I first saw it, does it run? And when we got it from Richard, um, the Gas Monkey guys did try to uh, at least hand turn the motor and they couldn't get it to budge. And uh, we really didn't care either way just because the originality of the car, we knew it has something. Um, so we bring the car back up to St. Louis. Our shop manager, um, you know, I said, hey, you know, we got this, it hasn't ran since, you know, since 76. It took him about a couple hours, but he got the motor free. And the motor actually turned really well. So now we're like, okay, we got a free motor. Well, let's, let's see if we can fire it up. So for a car that's been sitting around since 1976, it runs pretty darn well. All right, so we're gonna take a little drive. Again, this car, transmission goes in gear pretty well. This car, again, just has not been driven. I am the only person to drive this car since 1976, and that's a fact. So what's really cool is like, it runs pretty well, it drives pretty well. The tires from 1974 that the Dillons last put on, they're still rolling as of right now. Again, I can't believe how much, how many things work in this car. Uh, down to the blinkers, headlight, the sequentials in the back, all my gauges work here, all the interior lights work inside here. Um, I really can't find nothing that doesn't work, but that's just so amazing to me that this car sat around for so long, preserved, but still was able to fire right up. And all the other little accessories still be able to work. I haven't tried the horn, but I bet you the horn doesn't work. Because horns never work in classic cars. Ever. No. No horn. They never work, do they? Ever. Ever, ever, ever. But otherwise, everything else really does work. Steering's a little wonky because these tires are old, but you know, not too many suspension noises or anything. I just really need to drive this car today. Now for some of the really neat interior bits of this car, the originality especially. Get to really see all the really neat interior bits here. Again, nothing has been touched. We have a great dashboard. It's the right dashboard. Um, it's in pretty darn good shape. It's got a couple, uh, like some glue or something on it, but otherwise, um, it's in excellent shape for, for, its, for how old it is and original it is. Um, another cool thing to note on the early Shelby's, the early 68 Shelby's, is um, as you go past here, you know, you got the rubber on here. They all had, all 68's had that, but only the early 68 had these pillar pads. And you can see it's an actual pad that they got here in the pillar. And you usually only find these in the early 68's, not the later ones. So another good note to take a look and awesome condition that this car has along with its headliner, along with its sun visors. Again, nothing's repopping this car whatsoever. When you're looking at these da dash pieces of these Mustangs is if you ever want to know if it's real out of a 68 is you look at the horse indicator. And the horse indicator, as you'll see, has a little chrome bezel around it. And for some reason, all the repops out there don't have this bezel. And this car still has its original bezel in place. And that's a good indicator there. And then you get to the gauges. I don't think any of these gauges have been popped out whatsoever. Um, everything still works gauge-wise, even the gas gauge. I just put some fresh gas in it a couple weeks ago. Um, it was reading kind of empty when I got it. We did drain the tank of the old gas and when we drained it, it read, it read empty. Put about 12 uh, gallons at the best gas station I know around and the gas gauge works. Uh, the temperature gauge definitely works because that was a big concern before I drove this thing around is let it run a little bit, make sure nothing is overheating. Uh, but that gauge works. Um, you get down to the actual Shelby only gauges, the Smith gauges. You got oil pressure, oil pressure works, and the voltmeter works. It's really, really neat. The Philco radio is all there, it's correct. It's the only part I can't get to work. Um, I did get it once to kind of come on and crackle, but it's been intermittent right now. The ashtray is still here, obviously, but what's fascinating about the ashtray is there's still cigarette butts in there from um, basically, we know for sure, the early 70s. And they're Winston's, and as I talked to uh, 
uh, Matt Dillon, who was the uh, the Dillon's son, who uh, when they drove this car, when they bought this car in 74, I asked him if he, his father smoked cigarettes. He said he indeed did. I said, let me guess, they're Winston's. Well, hey, how'd you know? I go, well, your dad's cigarettes are still in the ashtray. If you move down to the glove box, yeah. um, when you first pop this, you see two stickers. Originally, the sticker that you see underneath is the generic Mustang glove box sticker. This is the sticker that all the Mustangs in 68 got in their glove box. And it was affixed right here. Well, it was when these cars went to uh, to Smith out there in, in Michigan, they when they were doing the cars, they would put this Shelby sticker over this sticker. So you, when you see the two stickers stacked on the top of each other, that's actually correct. And it's something you don't really see very often. Um, and then we go down even further. One of my favorite parts of this whole car is it still contains the Greenville National Bank um, floor mats, the cardboard floor mats. I think this was probably since they owned this, the, the Greenville um, Auto Mall, I would guess that this was their local bank that financed the cars if you're a client or a customer and you wanted to come in and buy a car. So this car still has those those floor mats, and they're again really good shape. A very neat piece of history. I'm glad that these kept um, stayed with the car. It's almost my favorite part of the car, along with the last license plate. Interiors of cars, especially a car that's 40 years plus, just don't make it because people drive them every day. So many different owners, um, they get completely thrashed. This interior, I can really say, is absolutely original. I know it sounds like a broken record here, but it's just so true. It's so cool to see. Start looking at some of the vinyl here. Um, this is the way it came. It's in really good shape all the way through the car. You got all the little details, even the stitching. Um, nothing really is worn down because, again, this car was parked. It wasn't that old when it was parked. It was about six, seven years old. Um, so I think they took care of the car anyways all the way up to that point. So when they put it around, it absolutely preserved well. When we got the car, the whole interior kind of had like a uh, kind of like a dust, mossy green. Uh, I wouldn't say green, but whatever it was from being stored, it actually preserved the car really well. So as we were going through cleaning this car and, and taking all that gunk off every piece, underneath that gunk was unbelievable, original, fantastic condition vinyl seats panels everything there's not even that much fade the black as you can see is very very rich um if we go to the back here you can see the back is super duper nice um as you can see the back fastback feet, uh, seats look great my favorite part is that they still have the deluxe cobra uh, seat belts and these aren't the repops or anything. You usually don't see the original ones like this. And when you do, they're usually like, like the Cobra is like real yellow and it doesn't look really well. This looks great. Um, you can see the Shelby uh, Cobra very well. The center console looks great. The, the console, it still actually has its stitching too. Usually the stitching just goes out and doesn't look too well. But the stitching on this is pretty good. Um, the Cobra Snake that's embossed in the middle looks great headliner everything i can't really find anything other than some dirt here and there that's wrong with this car um again i love studying it so now i really know next time i see a shelby what's real and what isn't and there you have it i really hope you guys learned something with our gt500 a lot of history we got to go through maybe a little bit too much but this car was so rich in it that we had to go through it all we really couldn't miss anything in this fantastic car this car is now for sale Hopefully with the history that we have preserved, that the car stays preserved and it's awesome, awesome condition that it is today. Complete survivor. Um, but if you're watching, if you bought this car, um, please comment below and tell us what you would do. And absolutely thank you for watching. And again, I hope you really enjoyed our GT500 as much as we have. MotoExotica.com She does run good. But I have a confession for you guys. This is really not its first drive since 76. So I kind of lied. It is its full drive, but about three weeks ago, uh, when I started working, getting this car ready for, you know, anything and everything, getting the car cleaned. Um, before we cleaned the car, I wanted to take some photos of it. Completely in its preserved state. The way we found it, the way we got it. 
Um, so I loaded the car in one of our um, wedge backs <clears throat> on our rig. And um, basically loaded it up, had some ideas in my head of where I should go, where should I take the photos of the car. I really wanted to take it somewhere where we bring it out. I was waiting for that car to go by. I haven't moved my head. It's okay, keep going. Yeah. Okay. So as I got on the wedge back, I decided to, to take it to uh, down Route 66. Um, thankfully, we live right by here at the Mother Road. It's just right up here. Um, I personally live off the road, just uh, about 15 miles uh, west of here. And there's the old Garden Way Motel out there. And the old Garden Way Motel was open in the 50s. Um, actually, I think it was open even before that, but the way it's designed, the way it sits today is basically from the 50s. They closed the hotel about three years ago. It was in pretty poor state. What's amazing about the hotel is, is it's still in its like look, its condition, um, its atmosphere of what it looked like in the 60s. So I thought it was a really good fitting location to take this car. This car hasn't been driven since 76. It's been dormant since. The old Garden Way Motel still looks pretty dormant too. I don't know how long it's going to be. They had to shut it down because the sewer was outdated and all kinds of other stuff. Um, absolutely love the location because it still just looks Art Deco. It still has it all going on. So I take the car out there, get it on the wedge back. It's about 7.30 at night. I waited till the sun started going down because I wanted some soft light for this car. And it also looks good because it's got these really big yellow, huge yellow letters that say Garden Way on the top. And they always pop in the photos. So I get the car out there. Again, at this point, we just got this thing running. We checked some things. We got the fuel out, got new fuel in. We put um, all kinds of things underneath the hood like uh, spark plugs, ignition, a new starter, and so forth, just so this thing could at least run. As I told my guys, I said, just make sure that I could at least run it, start it, get off the wedge, shoot a couple photos, put it back on. So I get there all by myself. It's kind of a creepy, kind of a creepy place when you're by yourself. Old hotel, you hear noises, you know, you know the story. So I get in the car. I, at that point, have never driven it. I heard the car running. I was involved in getting it running, but never really sat back in the driver's seat, turn the car on, and get it going. So I get up on top of the truck. I get in. I fire it up, and it actually fires right up. I had to nurse it a little bit because um, it was slightly cold. Um, it actually got to a really nice idle, and I backed it up. I backed it down. Um, I then parked the truck somewhere else. I took the Shelby to the spot in front of the garden way where I wanted to shoot. And I decided to actually let it run a little bit because I wanted to make sure it didn't overheat. So I let it sit there and run as I took some photos. And then for about five minutes, I would go over, check the gauge that works, the temperature gauge. And it was running, you know, it was right where it should be. It was not running hot. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's good. So it's not running hot. So I turned it off and I finished my shoot. Took me about an hour or so, changed the car a couple couple times around. Again, at this point, this car is completely not clean. There's still dirt and everything all over. You can barely see out of the windshield. It's just completely dirty from 40 plus years of dirt. Um, so at the time I finish, let this car go by. About the time I finish my photos, it's about 8.30 and the sun is pretty much down. I have a little bit of twilight where I can barely see it. I'm like, oh man, I gotta load this car up before it gets too dark. And that's when I, I will never forget this. I got back into this car and again, it was pretty much nighttime at the time. Um, and I, I put the key in, I turned the key over and I first, I turn it on, fires right up. I'm like, oh man, that's so cool. It's always cool when you first fire this thing up. But what was really cool is when I opened the door to get in it, I noticed that all the courtesy lights work. And then I fire it up and I turn the headlights on and I notice all the gauges and everything work. And uh, the lights, all the lights work. And I just, it was a moment at that time where it was kind of like, wow, like almost like a spirit car for everything to actually work in this thing. And um, I remember looking out the windshield, which was absolutely filthy. And I said, Mark, we're, we're gonna take this thing for a little drive. <laughs> And I'll never forget, as I was pulling out in front of the garden way is old Route 66. And of course, at that time, there wasn't much traffic. And I'll never forget looking out the dirty windshield, you know, and the sun was setting. It was reds and pinks and all that. It was coming through the, through the actual windshield, and it was just absolutely gorgeous. It was a perfect moment. 
So I drove the car for about a mile. I just wanted to see how it was. I remember turning the headlights on. The headlights worked. I even turned the old fog lights on. And uh, they even turned on. So I was at the moment where everything was working. And this I knew I was the only person who's ever driven this car since 1976. And for me to get in it, turn it on, everything to work, and take a little bit of a, a ghost drive on Route 66 by myself, it was a pretty... It was a pretty amazing moment, probably in all my years working in cars. I got to say that was, it's got to be at least top, top three, maybe top, maybe number one. I will never forget that day. So just wanted to come clean. We did take it on a much longer drive today. I would say it's first real drive, but I did take a little, took a little sneak peek drive uh, a couple weeks ago, but I, I had to share that story because I'll never forget that moment on driving this car um, at that time. So I wanted to share that. Very cool.